Hi, thanks for stopping by again. I'd like to wish everybody a happy Father's Day. Uh, whether you're a father, will one day be a father, or if you've had a father, I hope you have a wonderful Father's Day. Um, thanks for stopping by, as I said. Uh, I also want to point out, if you haven't noticed it, I have a very nice black eye. And I uh, had a little accident, and uh, I'm just going to leave it at that for right now. Maybe I'll turn that into a story on one of my stories here in the coming weeks. Needless to say, it looks worse than it feels, because I can't feel it at all. Three stitches, they'll be coming out later this week. Um, today, I would like to tell you the story, uh, or some of the story, of my third great-grandfather. This is Thomas Hilliard, and uh, spent a lot of his life up in the Cache Valley area, uh, primarily Smithfield. And there's some things that are still standing today up uh, in Cache Valley that are a result of some of the work that uh, Thomas Hilliard had done. So I want to tell you a little bit about him. Thomas Hilliard was born in 1831, in December, in a place called Doddington, Cambridgeshire, England. And uh, when he was a young boy of eight years old, his father passed away. His father was Thomas Hilliard Sr. And uh, his father managed a farm uh, near town. And so he died, leaving Thomas and his sister, I believe her name was Elizabeth, uh, and their widowed mother. She was 30 years of age when uh, his uh, fa father died. And um, she was left as a single mother to raise these two, two children, Thomas Hilliard being the oldest. At age 14, he was, uh, the term they use is bonded. He was bonded to the Master Carpenters Guild. And uh, seven years later, he obtained his Master Carpenter's Certificate. And the skills that he learned in woodworking and as a millwright would serve him throughout his entire life. And so this basically became a very, uh, very important part of who he was and of the things that he accomplished. Okay. Um, in 1848, LDS missionaries arrived in Doddington uh, in England and one year later Thomas's mother uh, who would be my fourth great-grandmother was baptized a member of the church and the following year in March of 1849 uh, Thomas was baptized and then a year later his sister Elizabeth was baptized as well now at age 20 this would be 1852 Thomas married his cousin I don't know how close of cousins they were, uh, but Mary Ann Heaps. And that same year, uh, Thomas, who had been ordained a teacher when he was baptized, the same year that he got married, 1852, he was ordained an elder, and he became the branch president of a small little branch of the church in Doddington, England. Um, he served in that position for almost two years, at which point he decided he would take his wife and their small child, Thomas Alma, who is my great-great-grandfather. They decided it was time to leave England and settle in America to join the body of the saints in Utah. Um, at this time, uh, Thomas's mother had remarried, and she had left almost a year earlier along with his sister Elizabeth, so they'd already uh, gone to Utah at that point. So Thomas and his little family traveled by way of Liverpool uh, to get to America. Now, when they got to Liverpool, they found out that the ship that they had arranged uh, to take them to the, the New World, uh, to America, had been chartered to be used by the British in the Russian War. And so they were obliged to take a lodging in Liverpool. It took them three weeks to find another ship uh, that they were able to settle, uh, to sail on. Uh, while in Liverpool, though, for apparently since the ship had been uh, chartered by the British Navy uh, to help in the Russian War, they were entitled to one shilling a day uh, as compensation for the, the loss of their uh, passage to the United States. Um, I don't know how far that went. i got to believe it went at least enough for... Uh, maybe a place to stay and a little bit to eat, but I'm sure it was a, a disappointment for them. However, on the 8th of April in um, 1852, they set sail uh, on a ship known as the Marshfield. 
And this was a ship that was primarily uh, composed of Latter-day Saints. Um, the uh, captain of the group uh, in charge of the uh, Saints at that time was William Taylor. And his name's going to come up here again in just a minute. Um, so they sailed across. Um, the one of the accounts that I have found, um, I'm going to read, uh, read the account here. This is out of one of the journals, uh, not of our ancestors, but somebody else who had uh, kept a record on the marsh field. And this is what it said. After a pleasant and prosperous passage of 51 days from Liverpool, the company arrived in New Orleans on the 29th of May, 1854. Only one passenger died during the voyage, and two children were born. Also, one marriage was solemnized. A number of the sailors declared themselves converted to Mormonism, but none of them were baptized on board as it had been the experience of former companies that some of the sailors would get baptized, hoping the intimacy with the saints thus afforded, um, thus afforded might assist them in their evil designs upon the honor of the young sisters. I thought that was quite an interesting observation and wanted to pass that along. So they arrive in New Orleans. Uh, they had been seven weeks making that uh, voyage across the ocean. They then, uh, from New Orleans, they sailed up a river from the, uh, took the Mississippi to the Missouri and uh, spent uh, several weeks uh, resting and preparing for their journey across the plains. Uh, they traveled west with the William Taylor Company. So William Taylor, who had actually helped bring them across on the marsh field, uh, also was, uh, led the, uh, the hand carts, uh, the, the, the pioneers, across uh, to the Salt Lake Valley. Um, they arrived in Salt Lake in October of 1854, taking seven months from the time that they left their home in England to the time that they arrived in the Salt Lake Valley. Um, in 1857, you may know that there was an invasion or uh, the threat of invasion by Johnson's army in Utah. Great-great-great-grandpa uh, Thomas Hilliard was called to stand guard in the, company, in the canyons uh, of Utah for a period of 13 weeks. And in May of 1858, following Brigham Young's orders uh, and instructions to the states, they moved to Provo, where they felt it would be more safe for the U.S. Army. It was here that President John Taylor asked Thomas Hilliard uh, to outfit his wagons and his teams for the trip south to Provo. And there, President Taylor set up a grist mill and asked Thomas to help upgrade, modernize, and see that this grist mill was working properly. Uh, I guess he had known from, again, his milling and uh, uh, carpentry days how to keep things in working condition. So that was what he was asked to do. Um, in 1860, the family moved from Salt Lake to Richmond, Utah, uh, where they lived for five years. Um, there were two reasons for this move. First of all, the sawmill uh, that Thomas had built uh, had been destroyed by fire. And uh, secondly, uh, shortly after their move, uh, there Thomas's stepfather died, and left his mother um, a widow again, the second time now at age 55. And actually, uh, she lived with Thomas uh, for the rest of her life um, uh, up in the Smithfield area. Uh, they built a home up. Uh, I did have the address. I don't see it right here. It was like something like First North and Second East uh, in Utah. And apparently parts of that home are still standing today. Um, they again started another uh, grist mill and also started a factory. The first shingle mill uh, in Smithville was started in 1865. Um, just as a passing note, and I know this won't mean a lot to you, but there were four brethren who got together in 1868. Uh, to form a sawmill. That was Thomas Hilliard, and then with Harrison Thomas, Preston Moorhead, and Samuel Ross Kelly. Uh, they started a sawmill and a lumber business up on the Cub River in Idaho. Turns out that Samuel Ross Kelly um, is uh, the great-great-grandfather of a brother that's in the Ashburn Ward. Uh, he and I got talking the other day, and uh, we found out that their, <coughs> their lives had crossed uh, several times over uh, the past years, and we thought it was interesting that uh, as their descendants, that Brother Oskelly and I would be 
uh, they were actually in, um, in my ward for a long time. So I th thought that was interesting. Um, in June of 1866, the bishop in Smithfield asked 44 men to assist in the building of a telegraph line which would extend from Logan all the way to St. George, Utah. And Thomas was assigned to be one of the men that would be responsible for getting the poles uh, for this telephone line. Or I guess it was a telegraph line back in those days. Um, Thomas was elected to the Smithfield City Council in 1870 and was re-elected to serve four more terms for a total of 10 years. Um, he must have been a well-respected member of the community. Um, one of his assignments uh, on the city council was uh, to s select the new Smithfield City Cemetery and also to regulate the burial fees and also to pay the sexton in charge of that, uh, that cemetery. Um, he was also appointed to head the committee to locate where the train depot would be for a branch of the Union Pacific Railroad that would come to Smithfield, Utah. Um, now, this is the story that I found very interesting. In May of 1874, uh, the United Order was formally introduced in Smithfield, Utah. Thomas Hilliard was selected or elected to be one of the six directors at this organizational meeting. Um, however, as we know, the United Order was disbanded. And in 1875, Brigham Young declared, and based on his instructions, uh, the United Order would not be followed. Uh, I was not aware that it had been that far developed or uh, to the point where people were selected to start to implement it. But I think it's interesting that great-great-great-grandfather uh, uh, great, great, great Hilliard was one of the six to implement the United Order uh, in Smithfield for a short time. Um, I don't know Cache Valley that well, but apparently on 141 North Main Street, there, in 1897, there was a building erected called Hilliard Hall. Uh, this was a rather large building at the time, and it became a popular site for dances and other forms of entertainment. Um, Thomas was given credit for f uh, furnishing the lumber, as well as designing the two innovations in the building. First of all was a stage platform on the west end that could be folded up against the wall. And second uh, was a elevated uh, dance stand uh, where the orchestra could sit, which would be suspended from the ceiling and could be raised up as needed, which allowed um, a lot of more room to be on this uh, dance floor uh, for all the dancers. Uh, the note I found is this building still exists today and has been renovated and equipped with a lot of uh, modern equipment, and it is currently a movie theater and if you're ever in the Smithfield area, I guess at 141 North Main Street, it's known as Main Theater and apparently is still there today. Uh, Thomas uh, took great pride in one thing in particular, and that was the finished carpentry work he did in the Smithfield Tabernacle. Um, he was very proud of that. And I haven't been able to find pictures of the interior of the building, but just doing a Google search on Smithfield Tabernacle you can see that uh, it was a very beautiful building on the outside. Uh, the spire, uh, from what I can tell, has since been removed, and I'm not sure in what condition or who owns it today, uh, but that was still something that he was proud of. I found one reference here that I can't confirm, but I just wanted to pass it on. It says, while living in Salt Lake City, Thomas was ordained a 70 in the second quorum of 70, and later served as a 70s quorum president. I cannot find any reference in church history uh, that there was a Thomas Hilliard that served in the second quorum of 70. Um, so I'm wondering if maybe it was a ward or state calling. Um, still we'll work on that and try to get to, to the bottom of it. Thomas died in January of 1907 at the age of 75 years old. And uh, funeral services were held in the Smithfield Tabernacle. And he was buried in the Smithfield Cemetery. Um, so there's uh, just a quick story of, uh, um, of uh, uh, one of our ancestors that was very dedicated, um, was very service-oriented, and I find it interesting that he was able to use the talents that he developed as a young man to put them to use not only for his personal life, but to help in the building of, uh, and, and do great things uh, in the work of the Lord, whether it was helping the president of the church, John Taylor, 
to build that grist mill in Provo, or whether it was to do the carpentry and the uh, finished carpentry in the Smithfield Tabernacle, or provide lumber uh, for various uh, places throughout his life. Uh, he was a, a man of great talents and great faith, and I think that's one that we can take pride in as well. So thanks for stopping by. Hope you have a great week. We'll see you next time.